and I don't, yeah, I don't think any like the school districts that I apply to are gonna listen to this episode. And <laughs> certainly, my current job now at a grocery store will not <laughs> will not care <laughs> about any of my beliefs about Robinson Crusoe or <laughs> or uh, writing workshops in the past. Oh yeah, yeah for sure, dude. Fuck. That's what I was thinking. Like when I first started this, like I was really worried about it too. And like my, my co-host that I had originally, uh, she was very worried about it. And like, I remember thinking like, just being like, dude, like I remember walking into the office at like the college that I work at. And this was like last, last fall when I was like, you know, checking in and getting like the new books or whatever that they changed. Cause they make you teach the one-on-one shit. And my department chair yeah. came in. I was like, Hey, I just need the books for the new, uh, new, uh, you know, whatever the required text that they make us put into the 101 courses and shit. And she was just looked at me. She's like, who are you? <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had been there like, like four years at this point. <laughs> yeah. Like being an app. I'm like, no, oh, dude, yeah. no one cares. No one knows who. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Man. No, that's sort of, it's comforting. Exactly. Right? Like, yeah, that is a li- it's sad and comforting, you know, it's always nobody cares until they do like that's why like nobody gives a shit about me and my podcast until like you know a year or two from now or whatever like some possible future they're gonna be like can you believe what he said three years ago if if you said something in class that went viral that a, a student took a video of and then they look into your podcast yeah that's totally a possibility i mean but yeah that's uh i mean i don't know it's it, it also really it, out of the times that it could have happened it probably it's it's not happened way more than it has right it's like it, we see online like so much stuff and we think it's everywhere but really like it's a minuscule amount so i mean yeah there is a, a cancel culture in academia in that way with kids taking videos students taking videos but I don't know. I, I just think the chances of it is pretty low. Right. Yeah, and we I feel like there is, you know, people talk about it all the time, and I've talked about it on this podcast all the time. But like there is a vibe shift that everybody talks about, but like it definitely isn't as mm-hmm. serious as it was in like, you know, the height of it, like twenty twenty or like shit yeah. like that. So there like, there is like a little bit of a cooling down going from like that ultimate peak in twenty sixteen post Trump to like Mm-hmm. What we have now like it has been like you know you if you're still worried about it you know what are you saying are you saying something really crazy that's like yeah deserves <laughs> it because that's like the only time it's gonna work now it's like back oh not gonna say it's back to normal but but yeah no i mean there's still some more of that like it it ramps up occasionally but it usually gets put out pretty quickly and each time it happens and the more it gets put out the less people take it seriously the next time so yeah for sure heavy bored heavy i am heavy 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 bored your name too eric with a k oh yeah yeah you has no, like no um i guess part on my dad's side but it's uh it's italian and hungarian on my mom's side and my dad's side it's like maybe a little german a lot of like british welsh okay. scottish irish uh you know just white yeah, but he, my dad just like my, my the story was is like my dad didn't like any other name except Eric, and he liked it with a K, and because oh, yeah. he he thought it was strong, and yeah, manly. So it is. yeah, that's what they went with. That's it. Yeah, the K is the bold way, the proper way. Yeah. To, uh, to, to yeah. Name Eric. <laughs> but I didn't know yeah because people. Like, oh uh, yeah, are yeah. you like uh, Scandinavian? 
background? Uh, uh, if my last name didn't give it away, I'm German as fuck, man. Uh, I guess pre- okay, what would be right. present day uh, <laughs> Austria, I think is. I had okay. a crazy uncle that like did this before 23andMe and all that, so I don't know how accurate it is either. But I, like you know, an uncle that was obsessed with this, and he like a couple mm-hmm. you know 20 years ago or something had this huge like thing that he gave everybody one Christmas, like this little kind of you know stapled together book that he made basically of like the genealogy. And he was able to trace it back without all the 23andMe shit uh, back to, yeah, like kind of like on the border between Germany and present day Austria back when like the German Empire, like back to that point. I think he traced it back to like the 1500s or something. Like he just went really crazy with it. You know, everybody has that kind of uncle. (laughs) So I was just curious when I saw the K because it's like the German Mm -hmm. kind of way of doing it. But yeah. Yeah, I mean, I figure, yeah, Winstead, it was, yeah, yeah, it sort of yeah, gives, it gives it away as German, but yeah. yeah, I don't know if there's, you know, another side that's, uh, it's weird, like, there's not, it's not a, Canadian areas. I think there's some, like, I think my parents did do, like, the 23andMe shit, uh, recently, and, like, they got, you know, I think, because my, my mother always thought, like, her father always said, you know, they're Italian, on her side, so my grandfather would always say that, but, you know, it was before all this DNA shit, so they didn't know. They were just going off what, like, you know, their parents told them and vice and shit. And then when they got the mm-hmm. DNA back, they're like, well, it turns out they weren't so Italian, you know, <laughs> like, kind of, like, thing. Like, <laughs> but my dad's came no, back. Yeah, yeah. I, I, was, I was totally wondering that, because, like, I won't do the 23andMe stuff myself. Oh, no. Uh, there's something weird about sending my saliva to... <laughs> the place that processes it and keeps track of it. I don't know. So I won't do that, but my, my parents will. Same. So <laughs> I figure I could just base it on them. And yeah, my mom's like half Sicilian, half Hungarian. And my dad is like just a mix of all the white, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's what my wife got. Shit. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's yeah, nothing really interesting, you know. It's sort of like, yeah, I guess I kind of look like that. Yeah, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> For, sure. For sure. And you say you're in Nevada, bro. Where Where are you at, in Nevada? At uh, Las Vegas. Shit, dude, that's where I am. You're in Las Vegas. I'm in Vegas, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's up. Oh shit! What what part? Uh, I'm in. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, I know that area. Yeah, Northwest. Oh, damn. This could have been a live. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was thinking. I was a live like, podcast. Yeah. Damn. Okay. Yeah. No. I'm. Uh, I'm on. I'm on Main Street downtown in the Arts District. Oh, you're, you're right stomaching across the from Arts the District. Plaza, yeah, <laughs> Plaza Hotel. Right across from Plaza Hotel. Damn. It's yeah, five minute walk. Yeah. No. It's. Uh, yeah. No. It's. Uh, it's okay. That's right by. That's the Oscar Steakhouse is right there, right or. Yeah, I had uh, I had dinner there uh, on Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday night. Yeah, that's yeah. Awesome, I posted dude. a nice steak. Yeah, no, that's a great steakhouse. Yeah, I love it. It's one of my favorites. And herbs and rye. Herbs right. and rye is yeah, the other. Just the yeah, locals' awesome. place. Yeah, the locals' place. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I thought you were still in Louisiana. No, 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 no. Uh, I've been here since like 2019. Okay, uh, but I was in Louisiana for like three years before that. Yeah, for grad school, uh, I, I I applied for some teaching jobs at those colleges, and it's just like it's difficult to get in. Like now, oh yeah. Anyway, but yeah, I've I've uh, gone on the track of you know taking the just teaching high school, middle school right. route, which I don't know. It's better than it would have been in California, I guess. Easier yeah. to get hired. You can, you know, apply at charter schools, right? Private schools. That's cool, man. Yeah, but, I didn't realize you were here though. I, I, when you said Nevada, I didn't automatically assume Vegas. I assumed like, well, it could be Reno, but really, this is the only city in the state. You know, <laughs> this is like unless I'm living like what Pahrump. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, some Cali, yeah, Nevada, like Nor. Yeah. Yeah, it's like Vegas, Henderson, which is like almost the same thing. I like, you know, um, and yeah, it's Pahrumpf, Nevada, or Pahrumpf, Reno, Laughlin. Yeah. yeah, those are the only cities that people pay attention to. Carson City is the capital, but what else yeah. is there? You can tell it's a relic from like 100, 100 years ago, Carson City yeah. being the so capital, what, yeah. 
Yeah. So why did you decide to move to Nevada? Uh, we came here for my wife. Uh, my wife okay. works in the uh, uh, the restaurant industry, basically here. Uh, and uh, when she when we moved out of Louisiana, you know, we lived in a very small town in Louisiana for that three years of my grad school, and she came with me. Uh, we weren't married yet, but you know, obviously we were serious. So she came with me for that kind of stuff, and and that was brutal. <laughs> So when we said when we leave, we're like, well, all right, well, if we're going to leave here, we could go back to where I'm originally from, like Baltimore is where I'm from. But like in my family and her family, she's from D.C., so her family's back in, in D.C. and stuff, too, and my family's back in Baltimore. So we're like, all right, we go back there. Or we could do, you know, do you want to do something else? Like we could go to like Vegas. Oh, uh, that's yeah, uh, that's crazy because um, so my girlfriend is she's a teacher here. Uh, we've been dating for like a year and a half and I mean, she's moving to, uh, <laughs> to Maryland, but it's because her kids want to move there. Like, and she d wants to move there. It's a pay raise and it's sort of like, well, the goal for me is to like get my teaching credential here and try to get something in Maryland. So it's like, we're trying to work this long distance relationship. Like, but like, yeah, no, it's really weird. Like, cause she's moving to Maryland. Like I've been there a few times and like, yeah, no, it's really cool. Like I'd really like to move there. Do you know where in so, Maryland she's uh, looking or family? Is? Uh, okay, that's so a little North in. of DC. Yeah. yeah, man. I know that area. Yeah. Well, baby. Yeah. My stomp it ground. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, and that's sort of like, I mean, that's one of the big like stress things in my life that has been going on, but <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. like, yeah, because yeah, I'm, you know, I have my intent to hire. So I'm like looking for jobs here, which is pretty, fortunately, like there have been like a lot of open positions and I've been able to get like a couple interviews, but, um, yeah, just like getting hired and being able to teach for a little bit and then moving there is like that's kind of like the goal. So yeah, I'm looking to go like East coast, see what that's like for a little bit. It is different. You're a Cali boy, right? You said you're from Cali or. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Southern California, Laguna beach. Oh, nice. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. It's different on the East coast, man. That's being an East coast, like mid Atlantic red. When I first moved to the South and then like the Vegas isn't, I guess it's not technically West Coast, but it, it, it tries to be, it aspires to be LA, you know, like Vegas try, like. It, it, it almost is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Without the surfing and, but I mean, it has like, it does have the snow. You can go to Mount Charleston. It's got hiking. It's got the sun. It just doesn't have, does not have the ocean, which is so key. Yeah. It's the, so key. The ocean is so nice. The lack yeah, of the water. There. Yeah especially coming, yeah. yeah maryland like everywhere you go man there's rivers there's there's the harbors like there's the the water everywhere ocean on one side mountains on the other so like growing to yeah, those places when you go to a place where that isn't it's like it does feel like something's missing yeah like you, the smell of salt mm -hmm. water when you walk through the harbor or something in baltimore you know like you're just like yeah like you don't get that out here <laughs> there is no salt water yeah. you smell like <laughs> as you walk outside or something but yeah, man, yeah. that's crazy. That's cool. Well, I guess how long are you in here? We should we should do something while you're at least get a drink oh, or something. I mean, I'll be here uh, at least maybe at least another year. Right. Maybe a little less than. Hopefully, the goal is less than. But yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, she's moving in like a month. Oof. So yeah, yeah, that's um, yeah. But like, I already have my intent to hire and should have something going on and i can get something in maryland hopefully dude like the know. high school like the high school middle school like they're so desperate for teachers like that's that when you're applying to adjunct colleges you're expendable mm -hmm. but then like that the level below it they're so desperate especially here really every city mm -hmm. but here i know there's a huge shortage so they're hiring anybody that's like yeah 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 you know yeah we'll do your intent that's what hire. i think like yeah yeah, because I was doing adjunct stuff in Southern California, and that just was like I was teaching at three different colleges, four classes, right. and between grading, the commuting between each, I mean, I had no social life. My girlfriend at the time was like, 
I mean, I couldn't see her barely because she was a teacher too. Like it was just, you know, I had to get out of that. So yeah, it was just like not good, especially for the pay. I mean, I, right. I make as much at a grocery store. Yeah. As I did <laughs> when I was working for them. So I was, yeah. That's great. I mean, yeah, that's where it is right now, too. And I want to get to this, I guess, in the second half when we start talking more detail about, yeah, that MFA, post-MFA life, uh, Mm -hmm. which is like, I mean, I guess there are always articles about it, but it is kind of like a secret. And I don't know if it's just like ignorance that like the teachers that are teaching you don't know or uh, it's more sinister than like they're just like lying about what the world is like uh, once you get out. But that's so cool. it is yeah. yeah it is uh it's pretty sinister yeah, yeah. No, i agree <laughs> yeah it has to be <laughs> all right so welcome to another episode of heavy board i'm andrew witstadt and i am joined by a special guest today uh at organized meet eric welcome to the heavy board oh thank you for having me man it's yeah, great to be here hell yeah And today, listeners, we are going over what is considered the first novel in English ever written, Robinson Crusoe by Daniel Defoe. And I know a lot of you had probably, you've probably heard of this book, although I doubt many of you have read it. Uh, But when I was talking to Eric and we were getting this set up and I was just like, hey, you know, like he would be down to do like a classic text like this. And I know not everybody's game for stuff like this, but with his background and things, I was like, all right, yeah, let's do a... Let's do a classic I've had on this list for a while here. Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe. And I always like to start, like, I, you know, this is kind of a nerdy podcast, man, so I'm always, like, uh, talk about what versions I read for the listeners out there, the book nerds, the Signet Classics edition of this that has a bunch of fucking dates here is when it was published. The one I have right now is first printed in 2008, but obviously this book, The Robinson Crusoe itself, was first published in 1719, uh, and it's been, you know, published a bunch of times since then. The first Signet Classics was 59, but the one I got to 08. Uh, What version did you read, man? Um, So I didn't have one of these on my my shelves already. So I just looked online and there was this it just said the original 1719 edition of robinson crusoe daniel defoe and it just seems like it came to me as one of those like um self-printed books yeah 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 yeah. amazon (laughs) style yeah that you did yeah yeah Yeah. it's like it said made in the usa Las las vegas nevada August first, twenty twenty three, which is when, which is pretty much when I ordered this. Right, it's like right after we scheduled. <laughs> yeah. it. I, I did that. I always fall victim to that. I'm actually in the middle of this bad boy with Wharton's complete short stories, basically. Oh, um, oh, I love her. Asia Innocence is one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh, uh, I'm yeah. glad you're a Wharton fan because she's yeah one of my favorites, and that's the same yeah, thing. I did. Awesome Earth, so good too. Yeah. And you never realize when you're ordering those fucking print-on-demand books, but like this was like a print-on-demand because it's all in the public domain, I guess. So some Indian guy or whatever put together like a PDF and like sells it on Amazon for like saps like me. It'll be like, yeah, I want the complete works. Like I, I want it, but nobody's yeah. actually published it from like a major press. So it's yeah, all that shit. Yeah, now I get that. So it was, but I did like. Um, I looked at some versions that were available online and it seemed like it, 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 it seemed like the basic version. It was just cheap and, you know, uh, you know, whatever, but it seemed like it was like the original text. So I don't think I lost anything in the translation. Yeah. You know, you're like, yeah. Yeah. And it even in okay. mind listeners, there's one, like there's a note in it at some point that just says, yeah, you know, like the text of this they've added chapters and chapter titles basically in the one I have. Mm -hmm. And I guess they did this probably like, you know, like 18th, 19th century. They probably started doing this kind of thing when scholars started, you know, putting their nose in to organize it some. And they said they also changed some of the lang, you know, some of the punctuation and stuff to make it more readable for a modern audience is what they said they changed. Yeah. But, and this now, thing's there, so old yeah like is there even like, like at some point we like 
is there even the original text in existence? You know, like at this point, it's been. Well, if you look at the original title, like, I mean, it's so long, like it's this huge, long title that it's like uh, the tale of Robin Crusoe and uh, like this, these huge long sentences. And like, it's, you know, he gets freed by pirates and pirates is spelled P Y R T E S. Right. And it's just, yeah, so it's sort of like a whole different language almost like it's, it's English, but there are some, some changes that are, are noticeable. For sure. Yeah. And I was, we talked about this a little bit in the chat, but the first thing I noticed when I started just like, you know, I pick it up like everything else and listeners know, if you listen to this regularly, you know how I go through books. I like to just let them wash over me. I don't like to look up anything or like context to like fill my head with other people's thoughts. I like to just like go into it as much as I can. You know, sometimes that's impossible, especially for books like this, like a classic. Oh yeah. That's the best way. That's yeah. the best way. Yeah. Yeah. For, and that's and listeners that don't know either. Eric has had had has had same type of situation as me. You've had rigorous training <laughs> in this fucking yeah. field. Yeah, <laughs> I've had to. I have been forced to read many many books that I don't want to or never had to. Some are good, some are bad, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. You get those degrees, and they just start coming at you with that kind of shit that you have to like force your way through in a week <laughs> in grad school or whatever, but. That was my first question, yeah. basically. How did it read for you? Like, just impressions. I think and for a larger question, you know, overall or first impressions, whatever. I mean, uh, how it first read was just, it was very dry. I don't want, really want to say boring. It was just, uh, you know, because the story was good. It was about this guy going on some adventures. Um, but it read, there were no literary flourishes um nothing poetic really you know imagery like uh you know stuff like that that you would expect from a novel that you could like analyze that how people normally consider classic novels like something they could like delve into that stuff with um it just seemed like someone something written by a basic like trade merchant at that time who had very like you know moderate education maybe right um and just knew how to tell a story about here yeah this is what happened you know and at first that was really off-putting for me because i was like okay this is a little boring but then when i realized no this is like because in in the first uh title that the book was given was uh it was you know uh robinson crusoe blah 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 like a bunch of other stuff and it says as uh told by himself <laughs> and that's like okay that's a big thing because then it's just like some guy who doesn't know anything about like you know writing to like really captivate an audience all he knows is just like here i'm gonna tell my story here's what happened he doesn't know how to like engage them with like uh like literary flourishes or like you know a certain like uh some imagery uh some something more sophisticated like he's just gonna tell you how it is like here's what happened and then i really started to understand like hey oh okay this is just a guy telling about his adventures and it sort of made me forgive the lack of like kind of drawing me in with that sort of like sophisticated stuff. And here's just a, a guy trying to tell me a story and there are some parts that are boring. I, I mean, <laughs> definitely there are a lot of parts that are boring for sure. Yeah. But there it's, so short it's like a page and a half and then they'll get you on to something that's in just interesting maybe for a few pages and then it'll be boring again and then it'll be like a couple chapters that are interesting like i mean it, it, there's a lot to it but yeah i i understand anyone who is like well this is just like a boring like there are some boring parts yeah there are but that's because that's how someone who was just telling a story would tell it like the biggest thing for me with his whole narrative is like when he 
uh, was a a slave for the Moors, he just sort of passed it off like, okay, yeah, landed ashore, taken captive by the Moors, <laughs> a slave for a little bit. I don't know. The guy wasn't too bad. Anyway, we got off that anyway, and <laughs> and then they move on with the story, like, and that was the beginning, and I had no idea, like, from my rudimentary knowledge of Robinson Crusoe before I had read this, I just thought he had one voyage, got shipwrecked, and, like, that was the story, but no, he was enslaved beforehand, <laughs> before this, by some other shipwreck that he had, and... Like, yeah, he just sort of passes it off. Like, yeah, I don't know. They weren't that bad. Like, there was no real pain in the ass for him. And me, I mean, I would have written so much <laughs> about being enslaved if I were enslaved by anyone. <laughs> like, <laughs> so that's, I mean, that was the first thing that, you know, it, it was early on. It was like in the first few chapters. So that's what really piqued my interest to reading the rest of it is like, okay, there's some crazy shit that's going to happen. Um, just because like this guy like, passed off being a slave is just like, it, it was kind of <laughs> for a couple of years. I don't know. He's just like a day laborer. Is like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I had to, had to obey this guy. I was a slave. That's okay. That happens. It's, it's normal. And I thought that was good because it was sort of normal back then. Slavery was normal. And right. he was sort of like, yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess I'm part of the whole, um, that trade. Yeah, for sure. And I was thinking mm -hmm. too, like when I first started picking up having, yeah, a vague idea of this, cause it's just kind of immortalized at this point being so old. And like, we talked about this a little in the chat of like having the title of the first novel ever in English and stuff. And I was thinking, yeah, okay, so this was originally published in 1719 and it's set uh, in the 1600s, mostly uh, like the late <clears throat> second half of the 1600s there. Uh, yeah. But like, yeah, I was actually pretty surprised at, at how kind of, I don't want to say modern because it's not, but just how easy it kind of was in terms of just like you mentioned the language being kind of very plain. This is post Pope. This is post, or I guess it's just right before Pope. It's like big stuff. This is before or after Milton. This is after Shakespeare, mm -hmm. right? Like, so all that kind of very high literary for lack of a better term stuff is, is not quite, at least in terms of the language, because then we, I want to talk to some about devices, you know, like the kind of illusions and things that are in here, because that's very literary, but the actual language, like, like what, like before, after the preface here, just the very first, I was born in the year 1632 in the city of York, like kind of just like, I don't know, I just wasn't expecting this kind of plain language, I was expecting more of like, yeah, like a Milton or like epic poem style language, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I was kind of like pleasantly surprised. Yeah. Like despite, yeah, like a lot of it boring. And then there's a few places that are repetitive too, I think, uh, which I want to get to with you, but it's like, you know, you can forgive it for stuff like that because like, it's so old. <laughs> like they didn't even know what the fucking novel really was like at this point. Yeah. Like crazy. But yeah, I was just, I wanted to hear that. Yeah. Like how you felt it read and stuff. Cause I was kind of like, man, you know, this wasn't as hard to read as I thought it would be. I thought it would we chat about this a little bit when we were setting this up. Like, I was like, man, this is going to take me like two weeks to get through, you know, like some of those older, like even something like Moby Dick or whatever. Like what I'm reading. Oh like yeah. 18th also, like Dickens, yeah. 19th. Sorry. Like yeah, Dickens is, I mean, and Dickens is really enjoyable. So it makes it so much easier to get through. But I mean, like he is very, he is very difficult to get through his prose. And I was expecting something, you know, along the lines of that. And, or even, uh, uh, Hawthorne, like, I mean, yeah, a lot of Hawthorne stuff is very difficult to get through. Right. Even though, like, I mean, it's a kind of, kind of some, the normal, like simplistic tales, but, um, yeah, I was expecting something like that and this was not, it. it was just like very like, yeah, it was like a diary. So I, yeah, that really surprised me. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess we didn't go over that. You had never read Defoe before, right? Like, 
Never. Maybe I have encountered like criticism of his in some papers I've read in college and they bring in like a paragraph or half a page to textbook experts or like excerpts from like they put in like those textbooks they give you and shit like Norton anthologies. Yeah. Yeah. The Norton anthology stuff. Yeah. I mean, that, and that is probably the edition I probably should have gotten from this just because it has all those, uh, colonialism, uh, essays in there about that. And I mean, I know like whatever essay I was reading, if I did encounter Defoe, it was probably about colonialism or, or something right. like that. Yeah. Because that was what they assigned to us in, uh, in graduate school there. But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, yeah, he he definitely like struck a nerve um, with those critics for sure. And I I, I want to get to that too the the colonialism take because it seems that has been like the kind of cloud <laughs> over it all. Really, yeah. since the I guess when that started to become a thing, like the fifties, when that's really started to take over criticism, these kind of like historical uh, deconstructions. That uh... if you're hearing this. It's because you are listening to the free public feed of Heavy Board. To get complete, uncensored, uninterrupted, full access to this podcast, become a subscriber at patreon.com slash heavy board. That's right. Heavy Board is made possible by subscribers like you. For less than one cup of coffee per month, you will receive private access to uncensored full-length episodes jerk shop heavy bonus content subscribers only ama episodes bonus extended interviews and more come join the conversation today at patreon.com slash heavy board everybody yeah, was, uh... yeah. The Edward Said um, type of criticisms and stuff like that. Yeah, it's yeah. Now the colonialism stuff uh, that's been like a big uh, like jackpot for like you know English professors or English majors to like write about something new. <laughs> that they interpret in a novel from like a couple hundred years ago where that stuff did not exist and morals were completely different and everything was completely different. So they can pass their moral judgments on people like (laughs) hundreds of years ago. And yeah, that's what's happened in the universities. Yeah. Hold on. My dog's acting crazy. Give me one second. Oh, that's all right. Sorry, sometimes she's just like, my wife just left for work, and then I guess she's like, didn't like the fact that I had my door closed in our little like guest room <laughs> slash office here. Uh, <laughs> she was like bitching. I was like, yeah. Well, as soon as I open the door, she stops. I'm like, yeah, brat dog. But <clears throat> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, that's that. I I do want to get to that. This that how it's the study of something like this, like a book that has this kind of importance, this kind of like reputation and like how we kind of this is where the canon almost start i mean not really because we have all the poetry and stuff that came before it particularly the epic poems but like for the novel form this is where the novel in the western canon basically starts from and i guess that's why they call it the first ever and i guess a lot of times they specify in english because you know there were novels before this but yeah because i mean john milton i mean was john milton he was before this right yeah i think 1600s uh, was his I mean, day. I know it's a po like people say it's a poem, but I kind of argue it's a novel. Like I say, you know, um, Paradise Lost. You're talking, yeah, Paradise yeah. Lost. It is. Yeah, I would say it's a novel. Okay, it's in the form it is, but really, that's that's a novel. That's a <laughs> yeah. Just because you rhyme doesn't mean it isn't a novel. Yeah, and I guess the way that was put out too, it was it was starting to become, I guess, at that time, even beyond Shakespeare's time, which is like the century before Milton, or I guess there's a little overlap. I think it started to be, mm-hmm. oh, people were buying books of this whole epic poem, like a new epic poem that was that was put out, you know, and they were buying yeah. that type of book and reading it as if we would read a novel today, too. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's not... 
it's not like a crazy thing to say or like <laughs> you know like unreasonable thing to to think of paradise lost yeah and, and it's so epic yeah especially when you think of like i mean yeah it's uh it's in in english which is like i mean that's just like the the language of like what was the, the emerging like world back then yeah. so like i mean all these other novels like gilgamesh or you know um beowulf or something like that like yeah they they were po like they were definitely poems and like they had that complete sort but like there's nothing like paradise lost that really had that uh that quality of being like very western and um very novelistic in like in its own way like uh it really like kind of like set the milestone so like i mean for me like i think paradise lost is probably the marker where we like say like there's you know like that's kind of the beginning of the novel right we're starting to move for, yeah toward and i i, I yeah. i'm glad you brought up milton and paradise lost too because i think this this is engaging with it even the way it's told that like we already mm-hmm. kind, of, kind of already said where it's just because guy Definitely. relaying the adventures mm-hmm. he's had and even skipping over large parts, but it's a huge scope like Paradise Lost or some of the more epic poems that we even, you know, the, the most famous one, right? The first one ever that we have history of Beowulf and shit like that. Like <clears throat> at least in English, I know, but like, uh, yeah, I, I think it, it is important how this relates to that, like how it's kind of a sprawling, you know, 50 year story, like, <clears throat> Whereas the more modern novel, we we do smaller scale story, and people still do the grand sweeping sagas and all that too, and those are enjoyable still, sure. But like, yeah, it's like before we started narrowing down that art form, really, I guess like the novels of like the nineteenth century and all that, like a lot of those hold up, especially kind of towards the second half there with, um, like you mentioned Dickens and and, and all those guys and and stuff like that mm-hmm. and, and Melville and and the English language guys, but like in the 20th century, I guess is really when it started, we started to condense those novels to like smaller stories and that became the norm as opposed to these huge sweeping, you know, hundred year sagas or whatever it is, 50 year saga. Oh yeah. No, all those Italian, like Gothic novels, the Spanish Gothic novels. I I read a few of them. I uh, I forget the names, but yeah. Um, um, castle of something right and it's, it's about a woman being in, entrapped by like her um, lover in some sort of castle and it's in a mysterious place of some mysterious place and um, the, yeah it's some sort of like sweeping like epic 600 page novel like all those Samuel like Richardson novels like it, yeah like, there were a few out there but I mean, in the terms of Robinson Crusoe, I mean, this is definitely is like the first adventure novel. And I think the, the earliest novel that I can think that really like take like you still hear about that everyone knows about, like everyone, like the original castaway was Robinson Crusoe and everyone in their mind knows the story of Robinson Crusoe. Like, even if they haven't read it, so I guess they don't know the whole story. They haven't read the first few chapters. Um, and they don't maybe haven't read the last, but okay. Hey, they've seen Gilligan's Island, which theme song is like, Hey, you know, like Robinson Crusoe, it's primitive as can be. Like, <laughs> right. So it brings that into like so everyone knows it by now. And like, I kept I kept thinking Castaway, the Tom Hanks movie. Like ca- that, and, and that was the second thing I was going to bring that up. Like yeah, Castaway, it's that is Robinson Crusoe. <laughs> yeah. But apparently it's based on a true story, so I, I don't know. But so but. You know, people do get stranded on islands, especially back in pirate times. Right. But so, I mean, uh, it, it is kind of that story that everyone knows. But how many people have read Robinson Crusoe? Not many, because even as a graduate student in in English, still haven't read it, which is a shame. Right. And I know you <laughs> hadn't read it either. So, I mean, 
what's going on with universities today, not making sure that people read Robinson Crusoe because it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Especially from a study standpoint too. Yeah. When you're forced to do it in grad school or even undergrad, when you're forced to read some of these older books, just <clears throat> what it, I, I, it's one of those things that I'm always fascinated by that on this podcast. I always try to bring it up and talk about it constantly where there's like, when books or any work of art, and you know, in the 20th century, we had movies that do this too. But like when, when a story or, a, or an artifact of the culture, usually it's a story or some type of, I guess that stupid word we use now is media, but you know, they, <laughs> the all encompassing, mm -hmm. yeah. which is fitting for nowadays, but it's just like, yeah, like I love when they go beyond what they are. So this is just a book that this guy wrote, you know, in the fucking seven, early 1700s. And you know, he had some experience traveling on ships and being a merchant and stuff like that. So he knew some of those details that he could put into the book. But it just, it's been built up now to a point where, like, like, like Eric was saying, if you, if you have never read it, you, you might not even know the name of it even, but you kind of know the story. Like, you kind of know already because it's so, it's been so baked in to the culture, to literature, to, to all these different things. Like you said, even in the 20th century, like Gilligan's Island theme songs and stuff, it's just so baked in that everybody's just kind of vaguely aware of it, even if they don't know it, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. And I love it. I mean, that's like when it crosses over, I feel like, cause I, I mean, I don't know when that is or what that time, but I feel like there's always these, these certain works of art it's awesome when they make that crossover to being bigger than just a piece of art that somebody was trying to make, but they re like they become a huge touchstone culturally, you know, historically, whatever it is. And it's just, yeah, that's, I think the reason I'm obsessed with that kind of thing is because I think that's what art and specifically literature is all about, right? Like mm -hmm. transcending that current time period and just becoming a staple in everybody's head. I, that's, I yeah. mean, this is off topic, but this is why I always defend Stephen King and stuff, too, because I think mm -hmm. to many people's chagrin, particularly academic chagrin, he's achieved that in his own lifetime, yeah. too, where like you, most people have never read his books, <laughs> but they know mm -hmm. the stories. It's already a part and like ingrained yeah. into the culture. And I know that seems weird comparing King to to <laughs> to Defoe here in terms of what they did for the art, but uh, I, I mean it it is because like I mean I imagine Defoe was like ingrained in the way that like so it, Robinson Crusoe was uh, based on like uh, some Saltzkirk Saltzkirk some sort of. Uh, guy who got marooned on an island by a ship he was on because he disobeyed orders, something like that. He survived eight years there. And that was around the time that Defoe was around and that story was big. And there were a lot of similar similarities between Defoe's Robinson Crusoe and this Selskirk guy. And um a lot of them was like, you know, he raised cats, you know, and sells Kirk guy raised cats. They were the, um, link or no, uh, the civic, the civic cats, the ones that you make perfume from. Right. right, right. Um, yeah. Uh, there were civic cats and, uh, the way he dressed, uh, there was just like a lot of other similarities, um, between them. And, uh, Defoe, like, you know, made it a point to make a novel about this person. So there was, like, he did sort of see this opportunity to, like, you know, kind of make a little bit money on the fact that this guy had, like, you know, uh, survived this this horrible thing and like yeah uh, it was a, it was a big story at the time it was a big news story so yeah it would make money and uh yeah i mean yeah sells kirk was rescued uh, there was more written about him um i haven't really looked into that but um <laughs> yeah me neither yeah it was it was definitely <laughs> like it, it, he definitely borrowed this story uh like <laughs> from what he read in the newspapers at the time and which, you know, he wrote more than one of these. Right. <laughs> right? 
I think uh, the intro that I read, and it was an introduction by, sorry, listeners, I know we, this is a nerdy pod. Everybody likes to know. Um, the intro was, who the fuck wrote this? I think they'd have a name on it. Paul Thoreau. And I think this is the intro in my version. I think he wrote this originally in the 50s when Signet put out the first printing of this kind of, you know, classics version of this. So that must have been written in like the 50s, I think. His, But he mentions all of that. Yeah, like how Defoe, I think he says in here that he wrote like over 400 books in his lifetime. So Crusoe, and he had like a career as a journalist, and I think he actually straight up covered some of that, the story you're talking about as like a journalist, because it was a huge story at the mm-hmm. time, and everybody was covering it, you know? And I I, yeah. I was, it didn't have this written down, but I'm thinking of it now. Since you're, Eric is a creative writer, listeners as well, and we're going to get to that uh, with, with workshop stories. He's he's uh, agreed to do some of that, too. Uh, <laughs> but I was, do you ever do that? Do you ever have like a, like a news story, especially in Vegas here? I, I find myself kind of contemplating, like if I see the local news, I'm just like, huh. That'd be an interesting story, you know, <laughs> and then maybe like right off of like the news story or anything. You ever do that? Or... <laughs> um, I mean, no, sometimes, I mean, maybe they have influenced me slightly, but I mean, nothing off the top of my head, but we do have a lot of crazy news uh, <laughs> stories. Yes. My favorite yeah. are the hookers, uh, like the hooker stories. Hookers. Yeah. And uh, like yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> where like you get like a local news store here in Vegas, listeners, those that don't don't live in Sin City, uh, where there's like uh, some some hooker <laughs> like stole like a hundred grand from some guy in a hotel room or whatever. <laughs> yeah. This happens like every weekend here in Vegas, and uh, yeah, they call the cops, yeah. and, <laughs> and then they're like, "Oh, I got you're soliciting." It's like sex. people are yeah. reporting that, and it's like, okay. <laughs> And some of those are pretty crazy, like how it happens and what, what occurred or whatever. Like if you read the local articles and sometimes I do think to myself, huh, that would make a good story if I embellished it a little, you know, like kind of like put a little flourish in there and exaggerated and made it a fucking story. Yeah. But I'm always no, curious. I mean, yeah. it was like, it was like that with the uh, storm we had here recently <laughs> or storm, storm yeah. in quotes. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, which was just supposed to be like, I mean, okay, it was crazy because I I don't know about you, but it came the storm came a little late because I was driving around Wednesday night and just a ton of rain hit. Oh yeah, and it had nothing to do with the storm, but it was worse than anything that the so-called storm previously brought. But no one was making a big deal out of it. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I don't know what to believe because, yeah, the whole, like, uh, hurricane or whatever that was supposed to hit, I don't know. Yeah, there's a little rain. Not much. And it is monsoon Spring season up. here in the desert. It's, like, beginning yeah. to monsoons. And everybody always exaggerates that, too, since I've lived here. They've always been like, oh, monsoon season's coming, monsoon season. And it's, like, one, not even an inch of rain throughout the whole, like, three months. Yeah. In two hours later, yeah. In two yeah. hours later, after all of this stuff, it's like you know, or two days later, it's like okay, the like worst rain hits Vegas, and no one reports on it. Okay, well, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Weather is fake. <laughs> the weather is fake. Yeah. <laughs> fake fucking weather. Yeah. It was that one. The only nice thing about that weather coming through Vegas was that it did cool everything down a lot. Like it did. We had like literally we were having like seven degree days here in August, which never happens. Listeners out in Vegas in August, (laughs) it's usually triple digits every day. Yeah. Yeah. Felt like SoCal. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But getting into the novel finally, yeah, since we've been uh, preambling Mm -hmm. so much, but it's important stuff. Yeah. I had this thought as I was just reading the first couple of pages, like, would you call this like a, along the lines of a coming of age story? And I know this is kind of before we had like the scholarly version of the archetypes and all that set up. But like, I, you know, there's the idea of like the young Crusoe, he's 18 when kind of the story starts almost kind of bucking his parents' wishes and kind of hungry for adventure, you know, and then having this terrible thing happen to him or I don't know, would you call it like along those lines or coming of age yeah uh coming of age and coming to god i mean yeah they're they're sort of both the same thing (laughs) yeah Uh, yeah, he he comes to maturity because i mean yeah he's like all right yeah my parents want me to do this normal thing okay 
I'm I'm more adventurous, right? He he's he's a little bit more of an adventurous type, and he just takes a trip and he ends up becoming a slave and all the same, right? And I, when he's on the island alone, that's when he realizes maybe he had like his rebellion against his parents and everything had been because he was following like you know more evil ways where it's like now he was more indebted to like christ and what christ would provide for him in order to like sort of return to nature like there's it's sort of like a an adam in the garden of eden yeah. story in a way um like someone that returns to god because he was never really religious beforehand. He was, he hints at he fo- that he followed the papacy, so he was Catholic. Um, and Defoe was not Catholic. He was like very much Protestant, which was odd. So uh, that well, English, yeah, 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 yeah. Now he was friends with William of Orange, like so he was yeah definitely Protestant. Um, he did not like Catholics, but Robinson Crusoe started out Catholic, but not like strictly Catholic. He, uh, just floated or, uh, you know, he, uh, he didn't take it too seriously. Um, yeah. yeah, he was mostly driven by adventure and commerce, but when he got in touch with like reading his Bible, he became more religious and there's some poor, some part towards the end where he renounces the papacy and says that maybe that wasn't a good thing to follow. Right. Cause he wants to go back to Brazil yeah, so, and everybody in Brazil is conquered by the Spanish <laughs> or whatever. Yeah, so they're yeah, all Catholic exactly, as yeah. fuck. Yeah. <laughs> At the time. Yeah, no, that, that has a lot to do with it too. Yeah. It's like there, you know, there's that war, like, I mean, um, pre church of England too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it is. So uh, I guess. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, a lot of this novel is yeah, I mean, it's coming of age, but I think he, he just realizes what is important in life, like yeah, and that's what the island provides him, and God provides him, and his faith in God provides him with everything that he needs to survive on the island, and. Uh, I sort of think that that is where Defoe was coming from because he was a merchant. He, I mean, the, the whole thing of colonialism, that didn't exist back then. Right, yeah. Like, and they just traded and tried to, like, make money on land that was... they trapped. Too. There is an explorer age and it was a mercantile age and that's where people made money on. Right. And so they weren't thinking in this like, oh, well, I'm colonizing some place. Like they weren't thinking like that. Right. And Defoe wasn't either. And so when he's talking about making money on the slave trade in this novel, like people – they're projecting they're modern, yeah, yeah. That, that, that'll just be like, oh, okay, he's like, he's a colonialist, like, here's <laughs> how he's horrible. Like, no, he was just doing what other people did in his time, and I, you, ha- you have to judge him on that. It's interesting you bring that up, because I was thinking about this as I was reading this novel, you know, preparing for this, and then, you know, just in my normal kind of you know, I watch Yellowstone and shit like that. And I was just kind of putzing mm-hmm. around the last week and I put yeah. on the prequel that they made of that, the 1883 series that they mm-hmm. made. And I just was struck by this thought because I was reading this and I love the scholarly articles and the introduction and the afterward in my version mentioned this kind of colonialism take. And I was just struck by the fact that like that story in 1883 it shows what it was the kind of westward expansion where it was like people talk about colonialism and maybe they were like at the the level of the courts and the kings and some of the elite governments apparatuses there was desire to quote unquote conquer you know with these colonies in these different areas but the people that Mm -hmm. were actually doing it 
like the people that they're actually being sent over like they were peasants man like they had they had no idea they didn't want to just like take things from people they were like yep. just literally looking for freedom and like free from persecution a lot of them were you know the original pilgrims like fucking fleeing persecution mm -hmm. like this kind of um like it wasn't in their head i'm going to take everything that you know the native americans have or whatever it was it was this kind of no i just want my own kind of freedom and 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 to to do what i want and practice my my own religion and I was just like, yeah, maybe we are viewing this the wrong way, just as a, a whole society at this day and age, where we're, we're kind of looking back on it as like a calculated evil that these people were doing, when in reality, they were just peasants, almost losing everything they had to travel across the Rocky Mountains, you know, that kind of thing, like, yeah, like just losing like, their loved ones dying, like, just like all the time, like, I, I just, it, I think it, it's too black and white how we view it now. But yeah, that's. And in terms of coming, it's bigger than a coming of age story too, right? Like that's kind of like, because mm. it is, it's like it starts when he's 18 and he kind of gets a few lessons in life. And then we, we follow him until he's like a 50, 60 year old man, basically through the whole story, yeah. like 40 years. Uh, and we do get the, the Christian illusions. Like I was, right away we get the illusions to Jonah and the whale. Uh, uh, <clears throat> we get the book of Job, keeps getting referenced constantly. And uh, the idea of, like you said, kind of the Christian or Catholic or, and stuff kind of predetermined fates or destinies and trusting in what, you know, God or whatever to lead you toward that in some way, you know, like what, what mm -hmm. I marked it here in mind, page 16, hopefully I marked it a little bit long of a quote here, but uh, I'll read it for listeners and then I want to chat with, um, and this is basically, I just marked this because it's like the first allusion that I saw, again, only 16 pages in, to the Jonah and the Whale story, like Crusoe being kind of damned as soon as he stepped foot on the ship, you know, like kind of thing, just like kind of the Jonah and the Whale thing. Uh, where am I going to start this? Mm. Uh and how I had come this voyage only for a trial in order to go farther abroad, abroad, his father turning to me with a very grave and concerned tone, young man, says he, you ought never to go to sea anymore. <laughs> you ought to take this for a plain and visible <laughs> token that you are not to be a seafaring man. Why, sir, said I, will you go to sea no more? That is another case, said he. It is my calling and therefore my duty. But as you made this voyage for a trial, you see what a taste heaven has this voyage for you see what a taste heaven has given you of what you are to expect if you persist perhaps perhaps this has all befallen us on your account like jonah in the ship of the tarshish prey continues he what are you and on what account did you go to sea upon that i told him some of my story and at the end of which he burst out with a strange kind of passion what had i done says he that such an unhappy wretch should come into my ship I would not set my foot in the same ship with thee again for a thousand pounds. This indeed was, as I said, an excursion of his spirits, which were yet agitated by the sense of his loss and was further and was farther than he could have could have authority to go. However, he afterwards talked very gravely to me, exhorted me to go back to my father and not tempt providence to my ruin, told me I might see a visible hand of heaven against me, and young man, said he, depend upon it. If you do not go back, wherever you go, you will meet with nothing but disasters and disappointments till your father's words are fulfilled upon you. And I know that's long, but yeah, mm -hmm. basically the first allusion to Jonah and the whale. And then like the basically saying that, like, look, man, you suck at sailing. Like <laughs> you're not a seafaring man and you yeah. curse the boat. And... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's like, I mean, there are a lot of like biblical allusions in uh, Robinson Crusoe. Like it's, I mean, especially the way he, I mean, he doesn't have a woman for himself, but he does have a Friday, right? Yeah, yeah. Like <laughs> he does have a Friday that eventually after what, 20 it's like 24 Is years it in the on 20s? the island. Yeah. Is it 24 years? Yeah, it's pretty late. Yeah, he's living on the island alone by himself uh, for a while. So um, sympathy for him. But uh, yeah, uh, so he he sees, uh, he, he does have a Friday. <laughs> uh, 
Um, and so here's where, like, I think a lot of the debate is on as far as this novel and what keeps this novel alive in um, college. Because, quite frankly, without colonialism theory or racial theory or class theory, maybe, I don't, all these theories that these colleges invent yeah. that <laughs> want to teach people. Um, I, I, I don't know if Robinson Crusoe would have been kept alive uh, because all they want to do is criticize it. Uh, they want to cri- criticize it mostly for the way that Friday is treated. And this right. is like everything that I've up on Robinson Crusoe and uh, literary theory is criticizing, you know, the the agency right. of <laughs> of Friday and uh, if he was treated fairly and all this stuff. And I just kept thinking this whole time, like he was from a tribe that ate people. Yeah. They were cannibals. And killed all those Spanish like, uh, <laughs> sailors. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, I mean, I'm sorry, but yeah, that's that's a little brutal. Right. I'm. Uh, so and he calls it. He refers to them as savages, which it should be pointed out, listeners, if you're if we're being serious and engaging with this work, that was the common term. Like, it was not considered offensive, like it would be today. Yeah. That mm-hmm. was the normal term to call these people that they saw that were literally dragging their their victims onto beaches and then cutting them into pieces and roasting them over a fire and like eating them like a fucking leg of chicken or whatever <laughs> kind of thing. But they, yeah, yeah, that that, that and I, they, I saw yeah. this when I did when I a year ago basically now when I did Moby Dick for this podcast where there was the same thing with Queequeg in uh, Moby Dick where there was a lot of the oh. kind of racial theory and and this kind of put on top of it um and and i think it does kind of whenever we put those frameworks on top of it like you were saying uh it it clouds out what the story is actually doing for us it it makes us pay too much attention to something like that through a modern lens as opposed to like the relationship that is trying to be established in the novel here like where yeah they kind of grow to love each other and not like a gay way yeah oh yeah yeah. Oh yeah, no, they so do. Yeah. <laughs> I I love that. Like, I mean, <laughs> right? Because Friday, like, he's like, hey, like, yeah, he liked the taste of human flesh. Okay, all right, whatever. Okay, yeah, but Robinson Crusoe had, gives him some goat flesh, and he's like, oh man, I'll never eat human flesh again. He gives him that sign. I guess whatever right. they say in the novel, like yeah, yeah, he he signed to me like that. He would never eat human flesh again, and it's like, a, yeah, I mean that's what you like. You should not eat human flesh. And I, <laughs> when I okay, when I was in grad school, and there would be some discussion of this novel that would come up. I would either see it in essays or people would mention it in class. It would be something about how Robinson just told Friday, you know, his only two words were yes, no, Friday, and master. Right. Right. And that he was his slave and all this stuff. But like, no, he was saving him. And like, yes, Friday was his servant, but he also just kind of treated him as an equal. There was no, I, I, I can't really recall in a time in the novel where I, he um, subjugated Friday. And like he told him to do like certain things for him. But other than that, it was not like a, like he gave him as much food. He treated him like himself. Like uh, treated him like I, almost I, like I, a like a like a captain would treat like an underling in, in, a, in an army or a ship or something. You know, like he treated exactly. him where he gave him and commands. He, like he was in charge, but he's still like there was like you're you're mm-hmm. asking somebody to do something for you, and that's still like a human like relationship. You know, like we. 
you don't want your you know your 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 underlings to hate you in those types of roles because then they won't do their job or whatever you know kind of thing and even on like when you have your shipmates and stuff and then people always leave out the fact that he saved him from a certain death too so there was this kind of saving (laughs) aspect where if he didn't step in and save friday Friday was going to be eaten by his enemies, another tribe that they fight with all the time, basically. Like, yeah. And he prevented that from happening. And that's, I mean, I, I think the more I think about it, the more I think we, we are going down the wrong direction, at least in terms of using like this kind of colonialism lens to interpret something like this written in 1719. But like yeah. this theme that I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about this, this theme of man conquering nature, especially when he's on the island and he's struggling to do it by himself, right? And he's mm-hmm. talking, I don't have a lot of these skills. You know, I come kind of from the English city. I'm not really somebody who is doing my own like butter and cheese making and, uh, and, and my own sewing and my own kind of, you know, planting and, and stuff. I was not, I guess they, they set it up with him doing plant, learning how to do that in the plantation before he goes on that island. But I like this idea of man conquering nature. <clears throat> I just wanted your thoughts on that. If you think it's after where it fits. I mean, where it fits is sort of, I mean, kind of like man being in touch with God. Yeah. Cause I really, I think for a Robinson Crusoe, God is in nature. Uh, just by himself he's able to like really get fully in touch with God in nature where there's no one else and he has to do for himself and he has to think about his own life in the past and what path it is it has taken and whether that's been good for him or not. Yeah. And that, that seems Like for me, and as far as like I've researched Defoe a little bit, like he was very religious. He wrote some sort of um, British book about like how like correct behavior and like how to etiquette. uh, Yeah, yeah, some sort of etiquette thing. Yeah, I forget what it was, but it was apparently one of his most best selling things. Something that made him the most money. Maybe not criticized as <laughs> as much but like i mean yeah it, he was involved with like a lot of um ventures and I, I think that worshiping god and like kind of having like a christian household was like very much something that he was trying to preach about so i can't help thinking of robinson crusoe, crusoe as like a, a novel about like getting in touch with god like you know just reading the bible because that's the only book that robinson had was the bible right right yeah and i I, maybe it's me and i'm like projecting into it because i I, i've been thinking about this more and more whereas you know culturally today at least this is the vibes i get whenever i talk to people uh especially people in the art world there's this a reflexive kind of repulsion at, at, at man conquering nature and you know uh, humans conquering nature people are going to hit us with the sexism for using that phrase whatever but <laughs> I just yeah. you know like human beings conquering the world around them in these different ways and we always we're, we're taught right now at least the last half of the 20th century into today I would say I can't pinpoint when it started obviously but before I was alive I just feel like that's so wrong. Like recently I've really been thinking about how man conquering nature is literally civilization, like, like, like man conquering the world around them. And I mean, something simple, like even like planting corn in this fucking Island where no corn grew, like he made it happen. Like he made the Island now Mm -hmm. produce corn. He changed the way the woods were set up around his, like, it's just kind of this, and I was thinking, I was struck with this thought. It's really stupid, but I was struck with this because my wife and I watch 90 Day Fiance, and this doesn't have anything to do with that, but like one of the characters on <laughs> oh, there. I, I, I watched that too. Yeah. Okay. Oh, nice. Do you, are you keeping up like, with it? 
<laughs> yeah. At the latest season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We've, we've been keeping up with these. I watched all of them. Yeah, my girlfriend. All the spinoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's great watching it with a partner too, because then you can talk about how much a better relationship you have than like the people on the screen. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh my god. These, these fucking disgusting losers. <laughs> yeah. These fucking idiots. <laughs> yeah. But there was a stupid thing where that fucking Gino guy and his his whore girlfriend or whatever that he's trying to bring over from Panama. <laughs> a Brazilian fucking big yeah. city. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they 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 were at the Panama Canal. And he was kind of, he's kind of autistic anyway, listeners, if you don't follow the 90 Day Fans. But anyway, the guy was very excited at the Panama Canal's, you know, uh, functioning. And I was thinking like, yeah, like, that is a wonder of the world. Like, we, this thing didn't exist, and we control the amount of water that goes into each little section of it down to the fucking inch. Like, how much water we let in to let the ships go past one another, you know? <laughs> Like that is man yeah. conquering nature. And this is literally the entire source of huge trade all over the world because of that. And just these little things, mm -hmm. and obviously Robinson Crusoe, it's smaller scale, but I was just couldn't help but keep thinking about this theme of he got marooned with nothing. There's nothing there. There's no people. There's very few animals and, and vegetation he's unfamiliar with. And then he makes it his home. Like he literally makes his it like- His castle. Yeah, a castle. His castle. Yeah. Like his castle, he's a king. Like hey, would you believe there's still an extra hour of conversation left? Well, there is. And if you want to hear the full, uncensored episode, you need to subscribe at patreon.com slash heavyboard, where you will receive full, uncensored episodes like this, without any interruptions, ads, or anything else. And that's for subscribers only at patreon.com slash heavyboard. So, what are you waiting for? Subscribe today and join the conversation. Heavy. Bored. Heavy. I am heavy, heavy, heavy. Bored. Sweats and the day sweats, pal. Pal, I do.